In the previous videos, we have seen a few applications of semi-definite programming. Today, we will take a look at a different problem called MaxCut. This is really my favorite application, which is the reason why I left it for last. This innocent-looking problem that has to do with cutting graphs in two pieces is in fact an NP-hard problem, which in layman's terms means that if you could solve it efficiently, you get a million dollar prize. At the risk of disappointing some of you, I must say that we will not be solving the MaxCut problem exactly today. But we will see an approximation algorithm based on semi-definite programming with an approximation ratio of 87%. What does approximation mean in this context, and how does it work, and where is this 87% coming from? And how does it all relate to the famous p equal np question? Well, I guess that's what we're here to find out. So, where is max cut? Let's forget about the max part for now. What does it mean to cut a graph? For that, you first need a graph, or in other terms, a bunch of nodes and edges between them. To cut the graph, you need to color each node with either one of two colors, for example, either blue or red. The value of the cut is then the number of broken edges, or in other terms, edges that have their endpoints colored with two different colors. To make things a little bit more formal, we assign to each node a variable xi that encodes the color of that node. For example, we can take 1 to mean blue and minus 1 to mean red. The nice thing about this encoding is that for two nodes i and j, xi times xj equals to 1 if and only if xi equals xj, and equals to minus 1 otherwise. So if you want to know whether an edge is broken by the cut or not, we can look at the quantity 1 minus xi times xj over 2, which is like a binary variable. It's equal to 1 if the edge is broken by the cut and 0 otherwise. With this notation, the value of a cut of a graph like this one is given by the sum of the quantity 1 minus xi xj over 2. And the max cut problem, as the name indicates, is about finding suitable values for the variables xi to make this quantity as large as possible. This innocent looking problem is actually notoriously difficult to solve, especially for graphs with a large number of nodes and edges. The best algorithms that we know of today that solve this problem are not that different from the naive algorithm that tries every possible combination of colors and picks the best one. And there are 2 to the n such combinations, so this algorithm becomes quickly infeasible. In fact, if you can find an algorithm whose running time is bounded by some power of n instead of 2 to the n, you would automatically solve the p equal np question, one of the millennium prize problems that comes amongst other things with a million dollar cash prize and a legendary status in the math and computer science communities. So fair to say we will not be solving this problem exactly today, but we can try to find approximate solutions. And by that, I mean find a cut whose value is at least a half or three quarters or more generally some constant C of the value of the maximum cut. This constant C is called the approximation ratio. The closest it is to one, the better the approximation algorithm is. Let's start with something basic. What if we assign colors randomly to the nodes? What approximation ratio can we achieve with this simple algorithm? Well, this is a probabilistic algorithm, so its performance will vary. But on average, each edge has probability one half to be broken by the cut and probability one half not to be. In expectation, each edge will then count as one half towards the value of the cut. And if we sum across edges, we get a cut whose value is half the number of the edges, and in particular, it's at least half the value of the maximal cut. Can we do better than 50%? The answer is yes. By using semi-definite programming, Gomans and Williamson were able to achieve an approximation ratio of 87%. And it's their method that I wanna share with you today. Their method can actually be applied to any integer optimization problem, or in other words, any optimization problem where the decision variables can take only two values, one and minus one. The method is called a semi-definite relaxation because of the following idea. Instead of allowing only the two scalar values 1 and minus 1 for each variable xi, we will allow each xi to be a vector of norm 1. And whenever we have a product of an xi with some xj, we'll replace that with xi transpose xj. And by doing this relaxation, we actually get a semi-definite program. This is because if you take the matrix of all inner products, and let's call it x for example, this matrix is positive semi-definite. And we can rewrite our optimization problem in terms of this matrix X alone. If this step seems unclear to you, make sure to rewatch the second video of this series, which explains this step in more details. And unlike integer programs, we have very efficient solvers for semi-definite programs. So we can solve this problem to get the optimal matrix X, to which we apply the square root operation to get the vectors XI. 
But remember, at the end of the day, to get a cut, we need the xi's to be scalars. So how do we go from unit vectors to scalars? This step is called rounding, and it's usually the most challenging step in any semi-definite relaxation. Gomans and Williamson proposed a very elegant way to do it. Since the vectors have norm 1, we can view them as points on the sphere. From there, we can simply generate a random hyperplane and assign the value minus 1 to all the vectors that fall on one side and the value plus 1 to the others. Concretely, you do this by generating the normal vector to this hyperplane from a Gaussian distribution, for example, and consider its inner product with each one of the vectors xi. If the inner product is negative, you assign the value minus 1, and if it's positive, you assign plus 1, and that's it. This is actually one of those things that is easier to do than to explain, so let's jump to Python and see how this is done. So let's say that the graph is given to you as a list of edges, and we want to find a good cut for this graph using Gomans and Williamson's method. We are going to solve a semi-definite program, so let's import cvxpy, declare our matrix x to be positive semi-definite, and set the diagonals to 1 because we want unit vectors, and set our objective function appropriately. After calling the solve method, we obtain the following positive semi-definite matrix x, to which we apply the matrix square root function to get our vectors xi. Keep in mind that these vectors would have the same dimension as the matrix x, which is 5 in this case, but we plot them here in three dimensions just for illustrative purposes. We then generate a random hyperplane and pick labels for our nodes according to which side they fall on of this hyperplane. And finally, after all of this work, this is the cat that you get, and you can check that the value of this particular cat is equal to 5. To summarize what we have seen so far, we first modified the original problem to make it about vectors, then we rounded those vectors back to scalars. But the big question now is how does this solution to the modified problem relate to the original problem? In other words, how good is the cut that we obtained by the Goman and Williamson's method? The exact analysis is a bit outside the scope of this video, but I will give you the main intuition here, so you can get an appreciation for this method. And if you want, you can look at the references included in the description for more details. Let's focus on one edge at a time. For example, the edge between node i and node j. For these two nodes, we have two vectors x i and x j that were returned by our semi-definite program. And we rounded them by looking at which side of this random hyperplane they fall on. Here is a question for you. What is the probability that the rounding leads to different labels for these two nodes, which would lead to this edge being part of the cut? When you think about this question for some time, you realize that it has to do with the angle theta between xi and xj. If the random hyperplane falls inside this angle, the two nodes will have different labels, otherwise they will share the same label. So the probability that they get different labels is theta over pi. The sum of these probabilities across edges is the expectation of the value of the cut that we obtain by this rounding technique. How does this quantity relate to our modified objective function? Or more precisely, how does theta ij over pi relate to 1 minus xi transpose xj over 2? Since xi and xj are unit vectors, their inner product is equal to cosine of theta. So the question now is how does theta over pi relate to 1 minus cos theta over 2? Can we bound the ratio between the two? Actually, let's plot this ratio as a function of theta. You can see that it has a minimum somewhere here, which is equal to approximately 0.87. This means that the cut that we get after the rounding procedure is at least 87% of the value of the objective value of our semi-definite program, which was itself a relaxation of the original max cut problem. In other words, Goman and Williamson's method is an approximation algorithm with an approximation ratio of 87%, which is very neat. This is really the state of the art. This is the best algorithm that we know of that runs in polynomial time. This ratio of 87% seems like an arbitrary numerical constant, and morally you would expect that with a little bit of work, we should be able to do better. But assuming the unique game conjecture, which is a widely believed conjecture in computer science, this approximation ratio is provably the best possible, in the sense that if you could achieve an approximation ratio of even 88%, then that would imply that p equal np, and all the consequences that would follow. If this does not blow your minds, I don't know what will. This is saying that unless p equal np, which would be some earth-shattering use, this simple algorithm, based on semi-definite programming, is not only good, it is actually the best possible algorithm. Which goes to show you the true power hidden behind this seemingly naive question that we asked in the beginning of this series about how to define positive matrices. This is a good place to end this series now that we have come a full circle. 
I must emphasize here, of course, that my goal of this series is not to give a full overview of everything that can be done with semi-definite programming. That would make this video the longest on YouTube by far. But I try to present few illustrative examples from completely different fields so that hopefully you could appreciate the breadth of applications that are possible with semi-definite programming. As usual, if you like the video, please make sure to like and subscribe and see you next time.